You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. Today, we're going to be talking about something that affects everyone on the planet, whether you thought about it or not. Am I going to talk about the erosion of our soil and what to do about it? No, we're going to be talking about menopause because about a million women every year go through it and some for way more than one year. And whether it's happening in your household, in your place of work, in your country, on the planet you live on, it it affects society. And it's something that seems to be getting worse and something that's always been a problem. So let's go deep on it in the episode today. There isn't very much taught in medical schools about what happens during that time. It's better now than it used to be, but we just don't have as much research as we would about, oh, I don't know, cholesterol, even though most of that research turns out was sort of maybe a little bit made up and worked to sell a lot of drugs. So you're going to learn about how to think about menopause because it's actually not an illness. It's something that happens. And given that I'm building a world full of people who live way past 100 years old, If you're a follower, you're probably going to spend a meaningful percentage, like maybe more than half of your life postmenopausal, but you're going to go through it, um, at least if you're a woman. Now, our guest is an expert on this who's a doctor for more than two decades. Dr. Suzanne Gilberg Lenz, OBGYN board certified in holistic and integrative medicine. And she focuses on this in her practice. Suzanne, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Dave. You could have focused on any kind of medicine. You could have been an elbow doctor. You could have been a (laughs) proctologist. Uh, I mean, I don't know why these guys want to look in people's ears. Like that just seems like a weird thing. It's all waxy and hairy in there. (laughs) Why did you go after menopause and hormones? Well, I mean, that's a great question. First of all, it evolved. Um, And when I was doing my medical training, I... I actually started medicine thinking I was going to want to do OBGYN and focus on sort of the lifelong medicine. Um, And I loved the opportunity to both do surgeries, but also practice like more medicine. And of course, delivering babies as hard as it is, is a really incredible experience. And, you know, now in retrospect with many, many decades behind me, I see that I was I was much more interested in lifestyle medicine, preventive care, and um, focusing on health rather than disease. And that's probably ultimately what motivated me to, to do what I did. So I loved the broad spectrum of opportunities afforded to me by being a, a gynecologist. Over time, um, really what happened is I, I think two things. I'm always interested in the things that nobody else seemed to be interested in. I'm super curious. And I, as I aged with my patients, I was following people through their life and, and wanting to continue to be able to address their needs and my own needs selfishly. And as you mentioned, really got almost no formal training in menopause in medical school. I mean, I don't, granted it was a long time ago that I was in medical school, so I don't remember a lot of things in medical school, but I really don't remember it being discussed very much. Probably it was like one slide. And, um, and even in residency, focusing on women's health, we got almost no training in it. And there's a lot of data also indicating that people come out of OBGYN residency feeling very, very unprepared to manage and support people through the menopausal transition. So this is not just like my personal experience, it's borne out by the data. And and I think the conversation that's now happening culturally around a lot of things, it's a collision of how are we dealing with aging and, and longevity? How are we dealing with women's bodies? It, it's it's just such an interesting conversation. So I could go high level for you. I could go you know micro, but that was where I was coming from. And then as I started getting into it and getting my own training and reading and researching and going to places like North American Menopause Society, combining it with my background in uh, herbal medicine and Ayurveda, I have training in Ayurveda, Indian medicine. I, I just saw the need really opening up and I saw that people just did not know what to do. And then we're being, falling prey to a lot of bullshit, to be perfectly honest. And I wanted to help people understand and, and relocate their agency in that process. You said some very interesting things in that intro and some very important things. This is not a disease. Uh, it doesn't need to be bad. Just because something's challenging or hard doesn't mean we can't do it. 
We just have to have the right tools. So, so menopause is like an ice bath? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> we probably need a more of ice baths, you know? No, it's really true. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a very specific perspective based on my own practice and on my own person, right? I mean, I'm a person who likes challenges. I went to medical school, for God's sake. Like, obviously, I like doing hard You're a masochist by nature. I'm crazy. It's, it's pathological. <laughs> and I'm a surgeon, too. So, you know. Like, oh, you're, you have an ego then. So an yes, egotistical all masochist. Of it. All right. It's this is going to be a fun interview. All right, I got it. <laughs> but I've learned humility. A oh, lot. wow. Practice. Okay. So, so an enlightened surgeon whose ego is smaller than mine. I love that. Good, mm -hmm. good job. Yeah. That's right. You like that? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. Check. <laughs> I, I'm wondering if part of the problem is that OBGYN as a practice, I mean, it, it we're lumping together female care and childbirth. It's as really if hard. It's a they're lot. the same thing. Yeah. You think they'd be maybe different. And I wouldn't hire an endocrinologist unless I had an endocrine cancer, probably. And even then I probably wouldn't, because endocrinologists cause more harm than good on average. There's holistic ones and all that, but they look at everything as a silo when the whole body is a system and you change this hormone and this one changes. So we have this built-in problem where maybe looking at women's care is not about childbirth. And when you lump it all well, in the same specialty, yeah. we have a problem. Yeah. I mean, and I will, to to the credit of the people that I work with in the field, I, I mean, people are coming in with the best of intentions and trying to apply the knowledge they have the best they can. And I, you know, I don't know that we want to like spend the entire, that, that I, we could do another podcast on medical education for sure, because all of us feel that there are some issues. And as these fields grow and we understand more and we understand what we don't understand, like how can you do sure. four years and, and know everything? But I want to remind you something, which, you know, it's, it's the practice of medicine. We don't come out of residency, you know, fully baked we still have some, some, we got to add some spices and we got to, just like anything that you do as a profession, if you're not remaining curious and open, you're not, and, and humble, you're not doing the right thing for the people that you want to serve, no matter what your intentions are. And then I, I think that was a lot of where I was coming from with the book and in my training, because I got, I knew I came out, I had, this was my training and now I have to learn and grow with my patients, as I said. And the tools that I got in residency and medical school, I'm grateful for, but that's not everything. You have to continue to be looking at data even as it evolves. Like stuff that I learned in medical school has changed. I graduated medical school in 1996. I mean, come on, things have changed. Yeah, we could barely spell internet back then. Correct. And now, you know, Dr. Internet uh, who has, by the way, replaced Dr. Google because Dr. Google has been neutered by itself. So you can't really search good medical stuff on Google anymore. It's it's very hard to find it. Um, so it's changed the practice of medicine. And there's there's something going on too where just more people are taking control of their own biology, which is the definition of biohacking. So all of a sudden, I'm seeing women now and in, in my, I've run an anti-aging nonprofit group with people three times my age for, for more than a decade. So compared to 10 or 20 years ago, the number of women who are saying, what the hell? I don't like what's going on during menopause. I'm going to change it. Yeah. And then they're willing to call a functional doctor right. and it works. And to my earlier point about endocrinology or dietitians, there's functional endocrinologists and functional dietitians who listen to the show. But if you, Dietitians make hospital meals, guys. Like, like that practice is fundamentally broken from an educational perspective until people who are licensed free themselves of it and then their own licensing boards go after them for actually caring for people. So those will get fixed. The job of this show is to find people like you who are working at the, wow, here's what's possible and shine a light on it. So we move the average expectations more and more in the right direction because yeah. everyone knows it's possible. And right. our menopause, it's like the lowest hanging fruit ever because a lot of women just suffer through it and soak their sheets at night with sweat one night and they're cold the next and it's kind of just... You and know, they're getting dismissed, suffering. even those of us yeah. who are not uh, ignoring those those issues that are really disruptive to not only our, our activity of daily living, but our, to our long-term health. And I have something very specific to say about that. Um, there, some of those people are, 
a lot of those people are getting dismissed. They're coming in mm-hmm. to physicians' offices. And again, you know, I'm, I walk a tightrope. I mean, you kind of just named it. Look, I'm a licensed physician. I believe in a lot of what I do from the conventional standpoint, but I have a bigger toolkit. I feel that restricting myself and restricting you in your interaction with me does not make sense for me. But I have to, you know, work within the system, sort of. So having said that, people go to the doctor all the time and hear, bullshit. They hear, uh, there's nothing you can do. They hear you can't do it. The flavor of the week this week in my office was people coming in and saying, could you please talk to my other doc? Because he or she is telling me I have to come off my hormones. Oh girl, come on. So, so that's the new, that's the thing now. Wow. It's so easy to like, if I take my car in to get it worked on and if the mechanic says he can't fix my flat tire, I don't just drive the car with a flat tire. I fire the mechanic and I get a different one. Well, but people are doing that increasingly. But this is in a very privileged environment. I'm in Beverly Hills, California, where people have access and sophistication. And even people who maybe aren't coming from Beverly Hills, but come from West Covina, you know, and they figured it out. These are sophisticated users of the system. I forget sometimes, Dave, because I have these conversations all the time, how few conversations are actually happening out there. How many people don't even know that there is a place that they can go to get better information, that there's a place that they can go to individualize their care, that there is a place that they can go to have community and not feel isolated. I mean, that's why I started doing menopause boot camps, and that's where the book came from. Because what happened was, even in my community, I just didn't have enough time to give people what they needed. And I actually started having these boot camps like four hour experiences where we would go do mm-hmm. deep dive, answer questions. My, my part, my life partner is a 35 year fitness pro. He's really knowledgeable about movement and nutrition. And we did a whole thing and people really, really needed it. And it was so interesting. I thought people were coming for the information and they were, but they were leaving with community. They were leaving, not feeling isolated, stigmatized. People didn't want to say the word menopause. What because did they want to say? Like that I, time or something? I, I, you know, listen, this, you got, what direction do you want to go in here, friend? Because this is like, I tell people all the time, this is the inner misogyny and ageism had a baby and called it menopause. This shit is fraught. So I will just tell you being a woman in West Los Angeles. Okay. And I grew up here. So I have a interesting perspective. And I think being a doctor and being like in my brain a lot, I, I've protected myself some in some ways. I'm going to get personal here. But at the pressure to look a certain way and be a certain way and hide who you really are and hide your power is immense. And people don't even always understand that that's really what's going on. And it's it speaks to some of the stuff that we know about control and other things. But that isolates us. And then we don't get the information. Or we get information that's... Uh, how legit is it? I don't know. Is it legit because you're, you have a business based on this and you're, you know, making a lot of cash money uh, or is it legit because you're really helping somebody uh, remains to be seen. So I'm dealing with all of those things and trying to create an environment where people feel safe, where they can get information and then they can have more of a conversation with themselves. What are their priorities? And then yes, they can go out and try to locate people who are going to work with them and guide them through this in a much safer fashion. And I mean, safer on all levels, Dave, I mean, safer spiritually also, because how we treat aging as a culture and how we treat ourselves and the wisdom that we gain being on the planet for a longer period of time says a lot about our culture. It says a ton. And one of the reasons that I am an ardent supporter of longevity is that I think the world will probably die unless we have more wisdom. Yes. And wisdom comes with age. And if you know that you're going to have to eat the plastic you threw in the ocean because you have another hundred years on you, maybe you won't throw it in the ocean. So I, I love that. But why do I have to have gray hair and worse posture and be slower and have a walker and a wheelchair and a diaper. You and don't remember my name. You don't. At the end. you don't exactly. And that, don't. that's part of longevity. But when we talk about aging, people see that. That's exactly right. So why do yeah. we have to say, okay, menopause is a natural part of life. Why don't I just say, you know, I decided I'm going to stay fertile and I'm going to set my hormones like I was 35 and I'm just going to do that time 105. Like, what's I'm- stopping us? That I will tell you philosophically, 
I'm not sure that that's really beneficial. And I think that's a philosophical conversation. And I will say this, it is. I will say this, here's where I stand on it. If that's where you're at and that's what you want to do and you understand the options, the risks and the benefits, and you have been thoroughly counseled and you want to decide to do that, I'm not here to tell you not to do that. That's not exactly what I'm promoting. What I'm promoting is again, people locating the agency that they actually have, which they can't do fully in a culture and in a healthcare system. We all know that's not actually a thing, but we're going to call it that because <laughs> that's the language we have available. In a healthcare system that doesn't even talk about it or teach about it, how is a person supposed to get all the options? They can't. So I, I feel like I top level, I totally agree with you. If we don't allow for room for people with wisdom, we're just, we're doomed. Any, and if we continue to also commodify absolutely everything, um, we're, we have some problems as well. The thing that we can do for ourselves is value ourselves, prioritize ourselves enough to avail ourselves of the information that's out there. And a lot of my book is really, uh, and, the, and the stuff that I've been doing, the work that I've been doing is stuff that anybody can do. Like you, they don't have to have so much access or so much money or, you know, even the best insurance or be able to pay cash money to do it. I want this to be something that, that people are a, have, have access to no matter where they are, you know, otherwise we're, we're, I don't know that this becomes a, a very elitist um, endeavor. And that's not, I don't think that's helpful long-term. Hold on, you work in Beverly Hills. Aren't you inherently elitist? 100%. Yeah, <laughs> it's a struggle I have. The struggle is real, friend. I know that sounds so gross. Hello, white lady. I mean, but, you know, I'm doing what I can. That's what, you know, I'm trying to reach other people. And well, the interesting thing about this is that when I was when I was doing the boot camps, and then, of course, COVID came and made me have to change everything, which is fine. I pivoted and it went great, actually. But one of the things that I'm, I'm working on right now is creating uh, templates for people to be doing their own boot camps. And it's in the book as well, in their, well, their location. Because how am I going to Cincinnati or Compton or Cleveland and I'm telling them what to do? Like I can give them the basics and then they can create the template or take the template into their community and tailor it. Again, that's individualizing again. Okay. It, it's interesting that you'd write a book called Perimenopause Boot Camp. I mean, it, it's such a... Such an intriguing title. Oh, really? Do you think so? Tell me why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Your book is really called Menopause Boot yeah, Camp. Yeah, it is. It and is. you mentioned that perimenopause is a word that triggers people. So I was just seeing if you would be triggered by it. And I could see you grit your teeth, but you really handled that triggering really well. So why is perimenopause triggering? <laughs> you know, I, it's really interesting to me. I think early on, it was great to have this name to sort of the the longer lead up and transition. And so actually, let me back up here for a second, because part of the, the issue we have is how do we speak to each other and have a conversation if we are not speaking the same language? And language is the most important communication tool that we have in this media, right? We got to talk to each other. So I think laying out the terminology is very important. And often people come in to see me or they ask me questions, whether it's online or whatever, um, they don't understand even what these things are. So here's here's the deal. When we're talking from the medical perspective, menopause or postmenopause gets confusing. When I say menopause, most of the time I'm talking about the transition, and I think that's what you're talking about. And I think that's what that is where perimenopause falls in. Peri just means the Latin for the time around. Menopause itself is retrospective. You don't know you're there till you're there. 12 months consecutively, no menstrual cycle for no other medical reason, hysterectomy, medical cancer, thyroid disease, under, I mean, oh, excuse me, over the age of 45. That's menopause, or, and now you are postmenopausal. The transition is really what is so hard for people. I mean, the whole ageism thing is that's a right. bigger conversation, and that's the rest of our lives. But let's talk about menopause perimenopause. So why is perimenopause triggering? It's almost turned into like a diagnosis, which it's not, or some kind of an accusation. People don't want to be perimenopausal. And I think that that's because they are afraid of the symptoms, of the aging, of the invisibility that they think, they're buying into the narrative that they think they're no longer going to be valued or important. And they don't, they also, again, don't have the tools 
with which to get themselves through that ice cold bath and understand they're going to get out of the ice bath and feel awesome afterwards. We aren't talking about it. So we are anticipating what we don't know. And that causes fear and anxiety, which is never a good way to approach anything, right? Your frontal lobes close down. You can't make decisions. Okay. This is just basic stuff. So perimenopause, I think early on, let's say five, 10 years ago, depending on your community and where people are at, was an amazing tool because it was naming something that was going on that people were not talking about. Pe women in particular were experiencing changes without their period changing, mood changes, PMS, mm -hmm. breast tenderness, uh, sleeplessness, weight gain, and being told by their doctors, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong. Your labs are fine, your labs are fine, there's nothing wrong. They didn't feel good. What are you talking about? There's nothing wrong. This human being just sat across the table and told you something is wrong with them. So even if you don't know what it is, or I'm going to own it, I'm the physician, I don't know what it is. Do you know how often I say to people, I don't know, let's figure it out together. I, I've done that my whole career. Wow. You're, yep. but you're I, unusual. Um, because I know, I know, the, I know. the I don't know it is a very hard thing for doctors to say yes. because it makes patients feel unsafe sometimes. My because you're trying to been, know. The, my experience has been it doesn't. It validates them. Because when I say to them, I don't know this, we're going to work on this together. Like, this is what I know. This is what I don't know. What I do know is you came to me, you're having an issue. Something is not okay for you. So we're going to figure it out. I've learned that's how I got to Ayurveda. Yeah. I didn't, do you think I, I didn't walk into Ayurveda on the street for God's sake. Somebody brought it to me and I was like, I don't know what that is. Let me check it out. Oh my God. I'm very interested. <laughs> That's really what happened. So perimenopause early on, I think was empowering. Now I, I, now people come in and they're like, oh my God, I'm in perimenopause. You know, like it's a disaster. Like someone told them they have cancer. So, you know, it's just words. I mean, again, if that word works for you, cool. To me, it's, it's starting the conversation so that we can get the toolkit going. So is it your view that as soon as things start to get wonky with your hormones on a monthly basis and you're sometime around that age, is that the beginning of menopause? Or what's the name for that if perimenopause is the wrong name? We can, we can call it what we want. I mean, I, I refer to all of it as the menopausal transition, which also okay. scares people because if you're 37, you're, you don't want to hear that, but you don't want to hear that because of all the things we just talked about. And mm. I think we have to destigmatize this word. Like, Lord have mercy. This is great. That means you're still alive, for God's sake. I, it's the puberty of midlife. If, if people feel I better don't... with that, we can call it that. <laughs> I'm going to have to be a little skeptical on that one. Okay. So I was the only... 27 year old in this anti-aging group full of people 60 70 and 80 because when you are in your 20s you do not care about aging no you it's, don't it's number 17 on your list yeah. what you care about is building a career and getting laid like yeah. that's what mother nature programs us to do yeah. and we, we care about those things before we even think about them we just know them to be true right so I don't, I don't think that this book is, is, I mean, if it reaches a 27 year old, great, but that's not who it's for. But they're you know? the ones who you have to destigmatize. Everyone who's already been through menopause or transitioned into it, we, they already know it, right? People who reach their forties and have some friends who've started it, they, they, it's a different thing. The, the problem no, with ageism. Dave, no, Dave, I'm going to tell you something. No, I I'm do listening. this all day, every day. I do I'm this all listening. day, every day. Yeah. And, and Partly because I, you know, look, my patients know what I'm up to and they follow me and all this other stuff. But uh, no, women get to their 40s and they really don't know what is going on. It's shocking. Or they yes. get to my, my cohort. So I'm 56 and a half. And um, my cohort is sort of, you know, Gen X, how we are. We're like, Wah! we're a little bit pissed about some stuff. But so, and we're like, why did nobody tell us? You know, that kind of right. thing is happening. And then the, the people older than me are like, ah, fuck it. <laughs> it happened. Um, but I will say it's very interesting. This was a really, this is pretty funny. I had something in the office and I was talking to one of my patients who was like 30. And she's, she was really into it. They are so, they are very curious about what's coming next. And they are very much interested in advocating for themselves. And she said to me, she's right, taking notes. So what's the book called? Uh, Menopause for uh, Millennials? <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, but okay. <laughs> of course, everything's about you guys. But, but that was amazing. <laughs> that was amazing. She was like so into it. So you might be surprised. There, there are a percentage of people who are into it the the point about telling younger people that they should listen to older people has been a theme 
I think since uh, like the first Greek tragedies were written and it yeah. hasn't worked yet. And I think it's <laughs> biological, <laughs> right? So we either have to put it in their language and I'll be straight up. Yeah. The anti-aging nonprofit work that I did, I could get no one from Google and we're four minutes from their headquarters. No one would show up for the meetings, yeah. which is why I stopped talking about anti-aging and I started talking about biohacking. And now yeah. I've got teenagers biohacking because yeah. it's yeah. a performance and longevity thing. Yeah. So how do we talk about menopause for people who really aren't that interested in it so that they become interested in it? That's how you destigmatize. I right? think I think just saying the word, and I, I again, I think maybe, and I don't want to be too, um, I don't want to generalize too much because I can speak only for the people that I sure. I have had experiences with. But I think in general, the red tent situation, communal conversations amongst women, that actually is ancient and it is innate in a lot of it, indigenous communities and a lot of ethnic communities. I don't think everyone listening knows what the red tent I'm is. I'm going to explain I, it. Yeah, it's, would you it, please? Yeah. It is a place that in ancient ancient times, many, many cultures, my own included Judaism, it was a actually a tent where people went to menstruate, right? But what was going on and to take care of themselves during that time, not running and doing, but being there, being cared for and attended. To. And the other thing that happened was that, so you had intergenerational conversation going on throughout women's lifespan. And you were, so you knew through when you were a, a girl, this is coming next and this is how you're going to be cared for and you're participating. And you knew as an older person, you're done with this time. You have the wisdom, you went through it. You're going to assist people through that time. Same thing with childbirth. The fact that we have to take classes now to have a human come out of our bodies is, you know, okay, thank God we have them. But obviously in, in the way past, and I don't want to romanticize the way past because women also died largely during childbirth, so that wasn't good, but you would have never gotten pregnant and had a baby without having had some contact with that. It wasn't the first time you ever had contact. You saw it on a farm or you had family members, people had births at home. Again, I'm not saying all that was great in every way, but the loss of wisdom and the loss of the intergenerational conversation is profound. And I, I do think that using the word and talking about it and reconnecting, and I will tell you, Dave, it's been really gratifying how many uh, groups have been coming to me to want to specifically have an intergenerational conversation to reestablish those lines of communication. Women are very tied to our bodies in a very specific way. I'm not saying men are not. I'm talking about my experience and women's experience. Who why, why don't you just say that women are more that way than men? It's okay because it's true. I think we are. We live by cycles. <laughs> we live by cycles. Sure. But we are identified. We are identified. Women are better biohackers than men on average because you notice changes in your bodies and we only notice if like there's yeah. a bone sticking out. And totally. That's or you're stereotype. bleeding to death. You're, yeah. it, but stereotypes are based in reality. Totally. So, I'm fine with it. So it's it's really, really interesting to me. In fact, the actual, like the big inspiration for all of this I shared with you, but the actual aha moment came when my dear friend, Erica Chitty, asked me to come to the wing, uh, for, you know, like in 2017 or 2018. And she wanted, she's 20 years my junior. She wanted to interview me about menopause. And I was like, really? Okay. And during that conversation, this is where this aha about intergenerational conversation loss happened and it all rolled from there. So even though initially this has been focused on people who are more immediately concerned with it, I do have a bigger picture in mind, which is for people to feel less uncomfortable with it. And I'm comfortable uh, struggling against uh, the tide of humanity. I'm comfortable with the fact that we have been trying to get people to listen to, uh, to elders for millennia. That's cool with me. I'm happy to be a part of, of, of the conversation just in general. And, um, and I do see things shifting and changing. It's really, really interesting. I think they are changing. And some of this goes back a couple of generations. Um, there's a researcher named Chris Masterjohn who was on my show like 900 episodes ago, <laughs> probably one of the first 50. He just posted something um, the other day about how the American Medical Association back, I think in the 20s or 30s, um, came after someone who'd written a guide on 
uh, women's care and specifically on birth and on uh, infant and child care. And they, they basically said, this is the doctor's job, not the mother's job. You're not a doctor. You're not allowed to do it. So they put a panel of physicians in place to muzzle the woman who had done this. It's been going on for more than 100 years by the trade union for doctors. Like AMA, we've got your number. You're not serving healing anymore. You're serving the profession and you got to back off a bit. Oh, I, I would, I would, I would beg to differ. I'm not sure they're serving the profession. A lot of doctors, I'm not, I've never been an AMA member and I'm there not, such a weird, but I'm not such a weirdo outlier. I just told you I have like a totally conventional sure. like practice in Beverly Hills. So a lot of us are not AMA members, but that organizational medicine and a lot of the regulatory bodies that we deal with are um, complicated, let's say. We'll just, I'm going to call it complicated today. That's my okay. <laughs> Complicated works. All right. Well, let's talk. In your book, you talk about menopausal hormone therapy versus hormone replacement therapy. Uh, why is it controversial and what is the controversy itself doing? I, and I don't think, it, again, it, this, it's so interesting to me how words like affect people. Um, I, I don't think there needs to be a controversy, but this is just a matter of shifting the language. And this is an interesting conversation that's getting um, reinstigated again, because in the UK, there's been all this information and all this attention on menopause. And there are a lot of people there who are very focused on like menopause as a disease and uh, menopause as an estrogen deficiency syndrome. And I, I, I know. So here's the deal. Like, I, I, how I feel is like you get to feel however you want to feel about this. I'm just going to tell you what I know. <laughs> if you want to call it estrogen deficiency syndrome, I think that's ridiculous. It's just a state of being. Now, that doesn't mean that giving estrogen isn't going to be helpful because estrogen replacement, if you want to call it that, or menopausal hormone therapy, which is now the more modern term, whatever, it's the. Blah, blah, blah. I'll tell you what gets people really going. You what? Oh, bioidentical. Wow, that word really gets people upset. It's silly. Like, who cares? Okay, it's a marketing term, not a medical term. Do I care? If I want to speak to my patient in a language she understands, then I need to understand the language. It's a word. It means that this hormone that comes from a factory, my friends, it's not being harvested in the wilds of uh, Ecuador by a shaman. Okay, that's not happening unless you're killing somebody and you're eating her ovary, which I do not recommend you do. So it, these things are just biologically as identical as possible to what our body was making, period, full stop. That's what it means. So I use the term because my patients use the term. And if my colleagues get upset, that is, a, they should maybe go to therapy a little bit more. I mean, it's a word for God. <laughs> That's Anyone it. who gets triggered by anything ought to go to therapy some more. Yes, um, I, I'm, I include myself. <laughs> I, I will well, do it. I do it. <laughs> you, you did handle the uh, the perimenopause boot camp thing remarkably well. So oh, I, I, okay. appreciate I, it. I meditated a little bit before our podcast. <laughs> so just, just a little though. <laughs> so, so it's all right. So so let's say um, a woman's listening to this and she's saying, well. You know, I'm pretty sure I might be going through this at some point coming up here. What do they get by looking at it as a boot camp? Like, it, do you test for hormones? Like, what's the first step? I, I don't always test for hormones. In fact, I, I test for hormones under very, very limited circumstances. If somebody's quite young, then I do want to make sure what's going on. In other words, again, I said to you right under 45 no period for 12 months. That's not normal. So there are some genetic conditions we want to look at and things like that. In terms of testing for hormones, this is the, this is where I do differ with some of the practitioners out there. Um, I'm not replacing the number. It's very different than things like thyroid um, or even testosterone in men. Although I'm going to put testosterone aside for a minute. We don't have reference ranges that we really understand to be normal. Reference The word reference range, I think you've actually talked about this on your podcast. Mm -hmm. I don't think people understand what this, this even this term means. I don't want to get too far afield, but te if you walk in and you're 47 and your PMS is on fleek and you're skipping periods and your periods are getting heavier and every, you know, now your PMS was three days and now it's 15 days. Hello, you're making the transition. I don't need to test it. What you need to look at now is drill down. Do you have any other medical issues? What's your personal history? What's your family history? What's your lifestyle? How's your sleep? What's your stress? How do you exercise? How are you eating? 
And are the hot flashes really the main thing for you? What's going on? And then we can sort of, we prioritize what the issues are for people. And now we can look at whether or not you want supplements, you want hormones, you're appropriate for hormones. Um, I have a lot of patients who come in who are very leery of hormones for a number of reasons that are legit for them. And they may or may not be science-based and that's cool. I will tell you that the vast majority of them will start with botanicals and end up on hormones because it's going to work better. And the other thing is that we want to help prevent the long-term issues. Okay, so what's going to cause problems for us? Heart disease, dementia and Alzheimer's, osteoporosis. Menopausal hormone therapy is beneficial for all of those things, despite what you've been told. And the risk of yes. cancer is low. I am a breast cancer survivor. At the moment, I am not. I'm doing vaginal hormones only, and I'm not doing systemic. I don't know. Do you know Avram Blooming? Have you read his book, Estrogen Matters? I have not. You should read it. It's a takedown of the Women's Health Initiative, which is a big study that exploded everything 20 years ago and created havoc and was highly political and really terrible and not looking appropriately at women in transition. It was looking at women in their 60s who already had heart disease, who were largely overweight and obese. And um, yeah, you put them on estrogen 15 years after menopause. And of course they had medical issues because they had medical issues. Right. <laughs> it wasn't the hormones. It's kind of like the Ornish diet. <laughs> like, yes, let's exactly. say it's the diet, even though it's the meditation you made them do with right. the diet. It's, yeah. not, it's not, so people, ugh, science becomes a religion too. I get so pissed about this. Um, here's the other thing, breast cancer survivors. Not saying you don't want, I don't want you to have breast cancer. It's terrible, it sucks. I had it in my forties, it was not fun. Here's the deal. Most of us get diagnosed in early stages of breast cancer. So I'm not talking now about metastatic breast cancer, or people who are 35 with breast cancer. I'm not talking about those people. The vast majority of us who are diagnosed with breast cancer are going to die of what? Breast cancer or heart disease? Heart disease. So we're doing people a disservice when we um, weaponize this stuff. And again, when we don't remain open and curious and having a conversation. So I'm not going to do this based on testing your hormones. I'm going to do this based on a much more comprehensive and nuanced approach, which is going to change over time. Here's where I do test. Somebody is on therapy and they're having a weird reaction. They're bleeding strangely. I'm going to look at their you know, uterus, do an ultrasound, maybe do sampling. I may look at their estrogen numbers. And this is one of the few places that I think the Dutch test, the urine test is, can be helpful because we metabolize through different pathways and we have genetic predispositions to make good estrogens versus bad estrogens that are more cancer promoting or not. Um, testosterone, people on testosterone, especially when they come in with a pellet, I'm going to straight up not okay with pellets right now. I just don't think the data is strong enough to support their efficacy or their safety. And I've had people come in with testosterone levels that are insane and testosterone, so your people know, can be aromatized, can be uh, changed into estrogen and that will cause other problems. This is not benign. Um, so I do follow my, my people on testosterone with testosterone levels sometimes too, but I don't do it by lab testing because again, this is not a disease. This is not a disease. You, you mentioned a couple things there that would be really helpful. We've got to talk about reference ranges and we've got to talk about vaginal hormones. Oh, yes. Uh, so let's start with vaginal hormones. I'm assuming you mean specific hormones delivered via the tissues of yes. the vagina. Walk and me through that versus injections. Yeah. Yes. So, so here's the deal. I mean, there are some hormone... Uh, um, delivery systems, one in particular, a ring that can be used for systemic absorption. Why? Because the vagina is very, very vascular. It's a great way to get medication into the body. So aside from that, I'm not talking about that, the fem ring, we can deliver estrogen and also testosterone locally to the vaginal tissue because one of the things that happens as our estrogen levels decline is that that tissue in the genitourinary area, so it's not just vaginal, vulvar, clitoral, but also the urinary tract, bladder, urethra, is suffering. The tissue is getting thinner. We have collagen loss. We have less elasticity. We have less blood flow. Arousal can become a problem. Sex can become painful. Uh, UTIs. 
pH changes, microbiome changes. So the pH changes were more susceptible to both bladder infections and vaginal infections, on and on and on and on. So there are a number of, of modalities that we can deliver vaginal hormones to that tissue to help replenish it. And it is so game changing. Again, I see people walking around who have dry vaginas and painful sex or aren't having sex who want to have sex or think they're having a UTI and taking antibiotics all the time and nobody is addressing their vagina. And it's like, what is that? So that's a, that's a pretty easy fix. And again, you're not going to get substantial absorption into your entire system. So you're not going to get the benefits that I just discussed, you know, brain health, heart health, bone health, muscle health, um, met metabolic health, but you are going to have really profound improvements in your everyday life and in your health in other ways. I, I, I've been talking about scream cream uh, for a decade on, uh, on the show, which is a vaginally delivered uh, hormones, usually including a little bit of testosterone, sometimes oxytocin, that have mm -hmm. just a profound effect on the health and other aspects of the of the vagina. Uh, so there's there's completely evidence uh, for this. A lot of hormone yeah. doctors do that. Yeah, I I've also seen though recently. I wonder if you see this in practice. There's a group of about forty thousand women on Reddit who are applying stronger testosterone only to the clitoris in order to actually increase its size and function. And, and they're mm -hmm. doubling and tripling the size of it and saying, I'm having mind blowing orgasms. Everything works better down there. And I just like, maybe it was not, maybe, maybe it needed that. Uh, so, I mean, some of the testimonials are, are ridiculous. So I'm a biohacker, like we have control of our own biology. Like as far right. as I'm concerned, if you want three boobs, you find a way to do it, you totally, do it. Like, you do totally, you, right? Totally, I agree. Uh, so, I think as long as you're not having like a huge amount of systemic absorption, because that can be problematic for them. But do you want to have a big clit? Cool. I don't care. It's not my clit. Do <laughs> is, is, it, is there a reason not to do that? Well, I mean, the only thing is going to be that if you change your mind later, like, oh, too bad, now your clit's really big. Okay. I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know what to say about that. There's that. But you're not seeing that in practice because that was a I surprising haven't. number of people. That. That's really um, interesting. Now I'm going to have to go check it out. It, it was in like it. Vanity Fair or Glamour or – it was Glamour or Vogue, one of those. Uh, one of the women on my team sent it to me. I'm like, oh, that's biohacking if I ever saw yeah, it. Yeah, totally. It. <laughs> All right. Um, well, there you go, ladies. Now you know about that. <laughs> <laughs> for whatever medical use it is, we're just going to go there. Yeah. So that's vaginal hormones, and they don't absorb systemically unless you use a lot. Right, right. Right. right and for right. guys, I used testosterone cream for a long time before I had kids because my testosterone was really low and yeah. it was under doctor's care. But the best spot was perineal for absorption, right. um, followed by armpits. And right. I'm guessing oh, women sometimes do that as well. Yeah. I mean, when we're doing, so here's the thing, there's the vaginal application for more of what we were talking about. Then there's also testosterone. We know testosterone is really important. Listen, we have more testosterone than estrogen women do when we're younger. We have more, more, I'm going to say that again. We have more testosterone than estrogen. We don't have more than men, but we have more testosterone. So as we age, all of these hormones are declining. And this, these are the things that we are not only feeling in our bodies and feeling differently, but do have health effects. So systemic testosterone, for sure, we have very clear data on libido and there is safety data. It's, it's, this is now here. Oh, I'm going to say the word FDA in all of their wisdom and all their misogyny won't approve it for women. It's cuckoo balls. We have data to support its use. We know that it helps with libido. We also know that it will probably help with sustaining muscle mass and other lean body mass, which is important for us to decrease our risk for cardiometabolic health issues. And I, you know, look, lifestyle and, and specifically resistance training and eating a certain way are super, super important for many, many reasons. But, you know, I think we need to be looking a little bit more at testosterone for overall health in women. And I hope that that will happen. It's very, very hard to get that that funded. And yeah. anyone who's listening to the show, who's a woman, has heard me talk about testosterone over and over and over, not because it makes you horny, which it usually does, but it's the hormone of desire for everything. So if you want to yeah. go out and make a difference in the world, and you're low in testosterone, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, your levels will be different. But if you're low for what your body needs, and there's a right. large range, yes, um, you just can't really wake up and give a shit. 
Yeah. And when your testosterone is there, like, yeah, like that really matters. I, I'm going to do it. And then you got to address thyroid so you have enough energy to do it. That's a Correct. different thing we already talked about. Yeah. But yeah. talk to me about reference ranges. Like what's wrong with reference ranges? I mean, listen, I'm not a lab director, so I'm not an expert other than knowing a little bit. And I just know that reference ranges are based on exactly that, reference points. So I believe that they are set uh, by community standards and bell-shaped curves. So you're really just looking at you in comparison to other yous out there, right? And I can't tell you much more than that other than to say as things shift in the population, um, those numbers can change and shift. And is that really normal, quote unquote? But here's the other caveat I really want to make clear here. When people go and get their hormones tested and they spend a lot of money doing this, Dave, and I'm not really sure what we're doing with this data, um, or they come to me and they want, they want their hormones tested, I don't know what your testosterone was when you were 27 feeling your best. You know, so I'm not sure, seriously, like I'm not sure what is going to be best for you. We're going to have to just carefully uh, look at how you respond and use okay. the best available information. And that's how we're going to do it. You oh, said something wonderful. so important. And my advice for people under 30 is always get one hormone test so you know your ranges and you can pin yourself there when you're 100 years older than your current age. Uh, for instance, uh, a friend has testosterone levels, who's a woman, has testosterone levels naturally that are as high as some men. Mm -hmm. And she's very feminine. And that's just what her body needs. Yeah. So if we were to treat to the average, she'd be completely testosterone deficient. Yeah. And if we gave her levels to someone who has a more normal range, then that woman would probably grow a mustache. So right. you just don't know, but yeah. you can titrate your hormones for how you feel. Exactly. Go, okay. go you know, what do they say? Uh, start low, go slow and follow people carefully. Here's the other thing too. I'm kind of backtracking a little bit, but I, I feel like I need to say this because I feel like your audience will understand this. Um, I have had people come to me from, I call them refugees, <laughs> the refugees from other practices. And I, and I, here's, especially when we're talking about sexuality and we're talking about vaginas, if you're working with someone who does not really understand that physiology and anatomy, think twice about working with them. I've had more than one person come to me who had their libido fixed and nobody ever looked at their vag and it hurt. And it was dry and it wasn't being addressed. They were getting systemic testosterone. Who, this person don't want to have sex? Like, what are you doing? And they were seeing a person in the community who doesn't understand vaginas. We'll just leave it at that. But this happens a lot. And it, you know, it upsets me because this is not doing a service to okay. vagina owners. <laughs> what are the top three things you would recommend a doctor do to be more familiar with vaginas? Um, train in it. And I don't think you can do a weekend course. Okay. Sorry, I don't. I think I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say what I say. I think if you're gonna deal with sexual health, you really should. And you're an MD. You should be an OBGYN or a urologist. You should be a sexual health specialist, or you should go do a fellowship or training with, you know, International Society for Sexual Medicine, which is an outstanding organization. Um, I, I, yeah, because that's not something you just get to know. <laughs> so, so you would say that if someone goes to their, their regular practitioner and says, I have low libido, that they should then, for women, refer out to OBGYNs. Uh, who are not more just all OBGYNs and also urologists. I'll tell you, I think our colleagues in the, in the urology community have really, they're on fire right now because they are attending to this uh, more seriously than we are. I, I mean, if I, if, if what I'm seeing online, and I've been in the, the digital health startup space as well, Dave, I was a chief medical officer of a sexual health startup. It was really, really interesting. Um, and I've been involved in, America, in, in the international ISSM and ISHWISH, which is the American uh, organization for a long time. And, you know, the urology community has been leading the charge for, way ahead of us. I think OBGYNs should be ashamed of ourselves, you know? Like, <laughs> wow. We want to oh, we want to own the vagina, but we don't want to deal with the vagina. I mean, I'm I'm really being a little cavalier here, but <laughs> but seriously, or like, you know, your plastic surgeon, God bless your plastic surgeon. I don't think your plastic surgeon should be doing uh vo you know, like the energy-based devices, which I do and I use. I know my way around that vagina, okay? Not only do I have one, but I am I've been doing this for 20 something years. 
And I just, I have an opinion about it. I, I think you should be very careful about who you are allowing to discuss that with you. And again, if someone's going to think they're a sexual health practitioner and talk to you about libido and not talk to you about the parts that are involved in the libido, I, I don't even understand what that is about. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, there's physical parts to libido and then there's the hormonal energetic parts. Totally. They both need to be lined up like that. And yes. sometimes you just need to have a good lover too. If you think you don't like sex, maybe just like get your partner needs to go to a class on how to have good sex too. That's the other thing that no one talks about in the doctor's office, I'm sure. Um, we're happy to talk about that in the realm of biohacking because it turns out sex is a nutrient and an environmental variable that controls a lot of how you show up in the world. So it's fair game here. Yeah. Now, one of our Upgrade Collective members in the live audience wants to know, what is the right testosterone level for a woman post-menopause? Oh, okay. So as you heard me say, it's more that I want to make sure that you're not getting too high. So I would, if you, I'm not going to test you for that number. The right place for you is going to be based on what was your objective in starting the testosterone. So was it libido? Was it sexual function? Was it something else? Was it, I mean, I, I like to be very careful about the sort of the fatigue energy thing, because as you mentioned, Dave, it's mm -hmm. also very much tied to thyroid and thyroid is another thing that gets a little bit ignored and sidelined. So I'm going to, I'm going to obfuscate a little bit there. I definitely don't want it to be higher than like 80 or a hundred that, that I'm, I start getting worried about that, but this is like not knowing anything else about this person. Okay. My, my answer as a non-doctor was until you can't wait to have sex every day and you don't have a deep voice or a mustache, <laughs> but it's a wide range. Is that a good answer? For you, it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know they don't want a deep voice or a mustache? Um, that's a fair point. If they want a deep voice or a mustache, yeah. okay. um, they can do that. Most of the women that I know um, who are looking at testosterone replacement don't want that, but they're willing to have it and get it removed as long as they have good sex. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a really, it's so, <clears throat> this is where it gets, you know, you can really get into the weeds. And like you said, it gets, uh, it gets complicated because people need to have their own personal decision-making power here too. Again, as long as they're being counseled appropriately. Of course. How do women in menopause lose weight? Oh God, that's the bugaboo, right? Um, how do they lose weight? First of all, I will tell you that focusing on the number is ultimately going to be a big problem because that number is not where it's at. And even though like a lot of the data that we use uh, is derived from with BMI, which is, that's a whole other wastebasket term, right? Oh, God, that's not very meaningful. Um, I understand what the question is because I too have been through this myself. One of the things that happens is as we age in general, we lose lean body mass. We put on more fat. Some mm -hmm. of this is because our body is actually converting adrenal hormones into estrogen in that fat tissue. And there's some thinking that maybe the body is trying to retain some estrogen that way. I don't, you know, that's may maybe more of a, like an evolutionary biology, uh, topic, but it's pretty interesting. We have a weight redistribution. So we go from having more butt thighs to belly. And the shape change is really a bummer for a lot of us because our clothes don't fit and we don't like the way we look. More importantly is cardiometabolic health and the risk that we are incurring as we end up having more risk like men because we don't have the protective estrogen. Estrogen is really protective uh, in terms of the endothelium, the lining of the vasculature. It's very, very important. So how do we change that? A lot of it, I really think, is going to have to be resistance training and building more lean body mass, um, not overdoing it. I saw a really interesting study yes. just this week. Did you see this with the training one day a week versus two days a week versus three days a week? That was so fascinating. And of course, it, it appeals to me and my philosophy of the middle way, but it turns out that the people who, these are women in their 60s, well past menopause, if they did weight training and cardio once a week versus two times a week each versus three times a week, the people, first of all, the weight training was the same. Wasn't that interesting that their, their lean body mass was pretty, or not their strength was pretty much the same, mm -hmm. but the people who did two times a week cardio had the best weight management. 
So not doing enough and overdoing it is yes. not good. As you age, I, overdoing it, you're going to hang on to weight. Your body thinks you're yes. going to stress and you have cortisol release and you're going to gain more weight. And then the last one is, and I'm going to tell you something, I live with a former pro bodybuilder. And after seven years, I finally listened to this guy. <laughs> and I listen, I, my portions are so much smaller. I'm a small person. I'm like five, three on a good day. And I don't need to eat that much. And I need to eat more protein and I eat smaller portions. I'm not restricting and I drink less and I don't eat late at night. That works for me. But I think the data supports a lot of that stuff. It, it does, especially not eating late at night because of the circadian relationship with hormones. It, it's just so well proven now. Yes, I'm, yes. I'm a huge, yes. huge sleep teacher uh, for that kind of stuff. And I, I'm a little bit, though, just thinking about when, when you go through that list. What was the second thing on there? It was, oh, it was about eating. So yeah. at any age, whether you're in menopause or not, I'm seeing an epidemic of women who exercise too much and don't eat enough calories. Yes, and they get fat yes, from that yes. because it, you end up getting so much cortisol, it breaks your hormones and you put on weight from cortisol, even if you eat less calories. Right. And, and that life, and I had this, I, I used to work out six days a week, an hour and a half a day to try to lose my hundred pounds. And oh my God, I was just so overtrained. It broke my thyroid, not as much as the mm -hmm. vegan diet did, but it did break my thyroid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this idea that you can do it, it's its absolutely awful. And if a doctor looks at someone and says, maybe you should exercise more and eat less, my advice today is fire the doctor on the spot. Yeah. The words are, you're fired. And, <laughs> I, and I don't want to pay for this appointment. It's that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, and so like, otherwise, don't take advice from your doctor if it's that advice. You, you just can't do that because it's especially mean to women. Yeah. Women are more sensitive in their fertile years to a lack of energy or a lack of nutrients and an excess of physical or emotional stress. Uh, because your body's like, oh, the world's not a safe place. Let's turn off your fertility. Exactly. It's not safe to ovulate. That's yeah. I see so many menstrual disorders. Ugh, I mean, we could do another podcast on that one, you know. It's and a lot of it is again, accepting a narrative that's based in nothing and really at some is really baked in misogyny. And that, that person providing that information does not recognize their implicit bias in that statement. It's really, it's not only not science-based, it's mean. You said it. Thank you for saying it. It's not cool. So we need to rest. Like we need to rest. We need to sleep. That is when our body literally does the work of detoxifying. Like you have detoxification organs, you have kidneys, you have a liver. They can't work if you're constantly feeding them <laughs> and they can't work if your body doesn't rest. Energy has to be distributed to different parts of your body. Your brain has to clean shit out too. Like sleep, you know, it's funny. The first thing I really try to address and it's the hardest thing to address when somebody comes in in this state is sleep. Yeah. It's so hard. But it's the most important thing. And if you don't clean it up, your mood's going to suck. You're going to feel like shit. You're going to eat crap. You're not going to be able to have a nice life, you know? It's, it's completely true. Uh, you got to deal with sleep. And the other thing that I think goes unsaid a lot is that it's okay to receive care. Oh, yes. And, and like this is a fundamental thing, and I'll be whatever politically incorrect here, but in the yin and yang teachings and the sexual polarity teachings, the feminine receiving energy, it's important that women receive care. And it doesn't have to be care that's tied to sex. It's just care. And if you don't feel safe to do that, I believe that you're more likely to have symptoms before menopause and after menopause, you're going to have more hormone things. It's going to be harder because- I think that's so true. I, I think that that's addressing the spiritual aspects. And I think it's enormously important because the other thing that's going on for women in this age group, thank you for bringing this up, is that we have spent our whole lives caring for everybody else. I talk about it in the book. Look, I got breast cancer at 47 and I have some- explanations to myself. I mean, yes, there's family history, blah, blah. But I feel like there was a spiritual message for me too, which was stop it. You, you are, you're not taking care. It was my left breast. It was my heart. Wait a minute. But it medical changed my doctors, life. Medical doctors can't talk about spiritual connections to cancer. I know. How dare you? Have you not noticed that I don't do it the way I'm supposed to? I mean, 
I can't, I can't help myself. So, but, but I'm very sensitive to it with my patients too, because mm-hmm. then you get to 47 or 57 and you've got aging parents, you've got kids, maybe, maybe you, maybe you don't have kids, but you have neighbors. You're literally taking care of everybody else, but yourself. And you're you talk about burnout. I mean, come on. So if you don't stop and just re- receive, I love it. Yeah. Wow. Huge lesson. I love that. Thank you for saying that. Uh, you're you're welcome. And people will say, how dare you as a cis white male say that? Well, because I'm a male. <laughs> that's that's why I can say that. Or at least that's what they assume about me since I've never actually come out and stated that I'm a male. So there, now I've stated that. So now if anyone was curious, uh, now, now you know. Okay. <laughs> but uh, honestly, I, I just think that it's important, especially during uh, pregnancy and around childbirth, it's kind of our job as a society to take care of women, right? And uh, we don't quite get enough of that going on right now. And that's, that creates long standing problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's just not that hard, especially during periods of need. So I would just ask, you know, everyone out there, like step up. If you see a pregnant woman, you can open the door for her. It's okay. Give her your seat. Just little stuff like that is important. And it's hard for us to know if a woman's going through menopause unless she tells us. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and if but you I know someone's going to start it, saying it, I want yeah. people to stop being afraid to say that. Um, I think there's a lot to be said for for just saying the word out loud. And I understand right now that people may feel that that would be um, offensive or something. But I mean, obviously, you're not going to offend me by saying that. And I think if we can decouple it, like I said, and de-weaponize the term and just be talking about it like we would any other life phase, then we can be there for each other and we can also learn from each other. And also if it offends someone, like you said, they should get a therapist. So I- Or, or you can apologize, you know, Jesus, you know, just like, okay, you didn't mean to say anything, just say sorry. <laughs> like, well, so you're telling people that they should say they're in, that they're dealing with menopause symptoms and then apologize if it offends the person? Well, I mean, I think if you, I'm just saying in general, if you offended somebody you didn't mean to, you can be like, oh, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm sorry. And move on. Okay. Oh. If you and I can go to our own therapy. <laughs> I, I was just like, that's an interesting approach. I usually just say, you know, I'm sorry you're offended. Get a therapist so you'll be less offended. And then I just go on my way. Is, okay, is that not cool. a good apology? We're, we have different, it's, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a little work. <laughs> Look, I identify as triggered right now. So we're just like <laughs> Are you going to get me in trouble? <laughs> I, I think I'm already in trouble. It might rub off on you. I apologize in advance. <sighs> but the the idea here is we can all act with kindness around yes. menopause or any other thing like that. And I'm going to be incredibly sexist here and say, if you're a guy, it's your job to do that for a woman when she needs it and ask for it. Like, it's okay to just be, yeah, sure, I've got that. Right, <laughs> that like that's how society works, right? And likewise, there are times when guys need help, and we ask for it from women. And sometimes it takes different forms. But we're I, I, when we talk about menopause and we talk about fertility, it's hard to talk about any of that stuff without just recognizing that men's behavior is a variable that changes women's hormones and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's a complex system, this species of ours, and you got to look at all the variables, including the phase of the moon, which we know affects (laughs) affects it, and behavior of others. So let's just throw all that in the mix along with some testosterone replacement. And I think we can create a pretty happy and functional society. There you go. We fixed it. (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're done. Amazing. Um, one thing, though, I, I do want to recommend as we wind up the interview is uh, your book, Menopause Boot Camp. Uh, for women who are looking at it, uh, women who are going through it or have gone through it, there's a lot of wisdom. And from this interview, I think people can understand you've, you've got the numbers side of things, but you've also got a perspective on it. So uh, congrats on writing a really a really good book about a topic that needs need some more attention. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dave. Thanks for having me on too. This has been a pleasure, really. (laughs) I'm serious. (laughs) Uh, Hey, interviews are supposed to be fun. That makes them fun to listen to. And uh, I apologize for getting you in trouble at least 47 times. I mean, we (laughs) talked about AMA, the F letter agency who shall not be named. 
Mm. Um, mm. We talked about menopause. We talked about men versus some good God. We're in so much trouble. I Dude, can I tell you, like, this is me. This is not. We found each other. Let's just put it this way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I look forward to meeting you in person sometime when I'm around the upgrade labs down there at the Beverly Hilton, which yeah. is probably down the street from you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey.